fucking song the band ever had. It was a big record, you know? Millions of people bought it. All my life, we just have to play when we play gigs. And to this day, that's by far my favorite song to play live. You know, every night, it's good or bad show, doesn't matter. Like when you get to that part of the set, it always goes bananas. If you're having a bad show, it's like that's the turning point every night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Foo Fighters. Ladies and gentlemen, Foo Fighters. Please welcome back to the program, Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters. Ladies and gentlemen, Foo barely got through making the record and then started kind of going up the ranks as a live band. We didn't have all this huge success right up front. It's just been these little milestones of things that we've been asked to do and have been able to do. Yeah, it was a fun time. You know, we were doing these great tours and the shows were getting bigger and we were on a good roll. We'd get asked to play on the MTV Awards and we'd show up and we'd be the only fucking rock band there. So it'd be like us and fucking boy bands, girl bands. Rappers, solo artists. After a while, we got suspicious, like, wait a minute, do they know who we are or do they just need a rock band? Thank you. After One by One, I went home and started demoing all this really delicate acoustic music. My time is growing thin. I thought, let's make an album where you have one CD that's all the really heavy rock shit, and then you have another CD that's really beautiful acoustic based lower dynamic stuff. Skin and bones, don't you? And we'll tour for six or seven months on the rock record and then go out on this theater tour doing the acoustic show. Since the acoustic record had additional instrumentation, I thought we need a bigger band. I always had in the back of my mind that someday I'll get to come and play along with them. And in 2006, Dave called me and said, hey, come out and do this acoustic tour with me. I didn't actually know Pat, but I was aware that there'd been a couple times through the years when Dave had almost brought him back. And so to me, Pat was just a guy that wanted my job. So when I found out about that, I was just like, oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Pat is a Foo Fighter, whether he's in the band or not. He and I have gone through a lot together. Pat should be in the band. I definitely thought it must be awkward for Chris. So I felt awkward only in that I hope this isn't awkward for you. In the first rehearsal, Pat showed up, and we actually instantly like hit it off, you know? And I sort of got to be friends with him over the course of doing those shows. Clive Davis came to see us play at one of the acoustic gigs, and I said, I think it'd be so cool if we were that band where we did the rock show, and we had all the people that loved the rock show, and we did the acoustic show, and we had all the people that loved the acoustic show, and they wouldn't necessarily have to go to both. And Clive was like, yes, but you can do both together. In a total Yoda moment, I was like, oh my God, you're right. And that was the next album, Echo, Silence, Patience, and Grace. Those songs were basically just that. So that tour and that album before totally shaped the one that happened after. Keep you in the dark and so
We were at a point in our career where we thought things couldn't get any bigger. We've headlined these festivals, we've played these arenas, we're perfectly happy with the way things are. And then John Silva said, do you guys want to play Wembley Stadium? And I said, fuck, okay, but wait, how big is that place? So when you do something like that, you put it on sale, I don't know, six months ahead of time, because that's a lot of tickets, 85,000 people. You're going to need six months to get rid of all those tickets, you know? And we sold it out. I couldn't believe it. So we put another one on sale. And it sold out in like a few days. And when it sold out, like it did, uh, I think we're, everybody in the band was just like, what the fuck? How did that happen? So it was this huge responsibility and this, this great thing, like, all right, it's our turn now. Like, we, we have to make it great. It was six months until we had to play the show. Every night before I went to sleep for six months, I'd think, oh my God, I have to play fucking Wembley Stadium. And then I'd wake up in the morning like, duh, we're playing Wembley. Wembley is so big, and it's like this sort of like, monster bowl you're playing in and just this sort of the weight and the sort of responsibility I put on myself for a show like that it's intense I remember before the first show I was so nervous and I somehow got hot sauce in my eye backstage like right before we went on I was like why now why does this have to happen now you don't just go like, yay, they asked us to do this thing and we're going to go and we're going we're gonna to do our best and, and see what happens. Like You want to make sure that it becomes the most memorable show you've done and know that, that you killed it. It was nerve-wracking because it's Wembley Stadium and if you've ever been there, it's so fucking huge. It's like an illusion. Did this band get this fucking big? Can you tell me that? I've got another confession, man. I'm your fool. Everyone's got the chance to break. Holding you. Wait. have 20,000 people and there's nosebleeds that are so far away, you know, you want to be able to bring everybody in. I want the people up there to feel like they're right there.
You'd kind of imagine that after playing something like Wembley Stadium and playing to 85,000 people, and God, what do we do now? Mm. Yeah, that's good. And it's the same way with records in a way. This is our seventh record. What could we possibly do that's different than the last thing we had done? B. And I thought, well, I want to do the next one in the garage. It's about making records the way we used to fucking make records. But let's do it with Butch Vig, so it's fucking huge. Butch Vig, you know, is probably most well known for doing Nevermind, the Nirvana record. And, uh, but he's done you know, a ton of stuff through the years. You know, he did the last Green Day record, and he was in garbage. And he's been a working producer for a long time. Dave said, I want to make the record in my garage. And then he said, what do you think about making the record on tape? I want to get away from what people think we should do. I learned how to make records on tape, and there's something about that process that I love, but you can't fix things like when you're working purely in a digital format. And that's the first thing I said to the band, if we're going to do this on tape, you guys have to play really well because nothing's going to be fixed. I think most people have at least an idea of how records are made now. They're made on computers. You can do whatever with computers, but... We all grew up making records on tape. It's got a certain sound. It's got a certain set of limitations. You can't go in and just go like, well, that's close enough. Wow, this is great. Rock and roll is imperfection and flaws and four or five or six or eight people playing together, and it's not going to line up. It's going to be a little fucked up. It should be, because that's what human beings, you know, human beings aren't perfect. Just say hello. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> what was really different was the environment doing at Dave's house which is the most comfortable <laughs> environment you can imagine. It's like, it's just fun to be there anyways. And I think the atmosphere of where you're recording has to come out on the record. I don't see how it couldn't. Look at this crew. Look at the Hawkins. What, are you kidding me? <laughs> the engineers and everybody at one point were like, okay, we're going to need this and this and this and, you know, $700,000 worth of out. 